Yeah, what's up? Welcome to your, now it's pretty much weekly edition of Beyond the Box Score. Adam Azer here on a Friday morning with Jacob Gibbs. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. YouTube.com slash fantasy football today. Please hit the like button. If you are not, you're listening to this on the weekend. And I want to thank Jacob for organizing yet another great show. Today, we're going to talk about wide receiver versus coverage data, man zone, a man coverage, zone coverage, press coverage, and what you can get out of that for fantasy purposes. Jacob, I have a random question for you. Looking looking buff as always, uh, yeah, but uh, that's not my question. What is your favorite ice cream flavor, Jacob? Uh, I think I've got to go cookies and cream. I've got a soft spot for cookie dough as well. Yeah, those are good choices. Pretty standard stuff. I bring that up because you are – It's this is like me taking my kids to the ice cream store. That's how excited you have been for this episode and for having Matt Harmon of Yahoo on. Um, so – so, like, I don't know, happy birthday, Jacob. I know it's a big day for you having Matt on the show. I am so psyched to uh, to talk to Matt, uh, for sure. I think that's a great analogy. Matt, welcome. Um, yeah, Jacob's been super psyched. I'm extremely excited to have you on. Thrilled to have you on. I understand you just made a big move across the country as well. How's life going for you, Matt? Yeah, uh, well, number one, a lot of a uh, lot of hype to live up to with that introduction there. So uh, <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to deliver on this episode. I'll do my best, but yeah, probably the most uh, like the biggest pain I've ever been scheduling a podcast, like being a scheduled guest on a podcast. Uh, this ep- this particular episode, just because yeah, I did move across the country. But Jacob and I have been talking about doing this for a long time now. Um, I'm excited to chop it up today. Like this, I mean, this is the stuff I think about, talk about all the time. Uh, so I'm I'm hyped to talk about why receivers in this episode yeah we're extremely excited to have you and you can just chime in what's your favorite ice cream flavor as we're doing that yeah i'm a big uh i'm a big chocolate guy extremely basic uh oh. but you know w- whether it's chocolate you know chocolate chip cookie dough uh, cookies and cream i mean you can get me going with any type of oreo situation uh so i'm i'm in on anything like that you know I, i'm not a big like fruit flavor ice cream type of guy i'm just like a, a, a chocolate fan through and through so anything anything that revolves around chocolate i'm in on okay and all right last like silly question here before we get into the show and all the players we're going to talk about like uh jerry judy it seems to come up on any show that jacob and i are on and uh, a, lot, a lot more uh, christian a lot of the younger guys as well because we're looking for breakouts here uh this is more of a visual question but what is bigger maybe the audience can vote uh jacob i don't know if you want to flex maybe like show a bicep or Matt's water bottle, which uh, is one of the more aggressive ones I've seen. On the, on, look at that. Look at that. Whoa. <laughs> you that on the show today? <laughs> uh, no, definitely not on the show today. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, do the show in the in, in season with Austin Eckler, and he called it uh, the aquarium. So uh, <laughs> I, I <laughs> there's no fish swimming around in this thing. But uh, yeah, it is definitely a rather aggressive. Like, you know, listen, you do the I always try to drink one gallon of water a day. You know, it's part of part of my whole thing. Um, and but I, I don't like when water gets warm. And, you know, those typical like big water. I mean, I used to be like a, a total, you know, meathead and just drink out of the like empty milk jug uh, type looking gallon. <laughs> but obviously then it became like trendy to have the, you know, the, uh, pe- sure people have seen them with like the measures uh, on the side. But the water gets warm at the end of the day. So. Uh, I still want to be comfortable and be uh, spoiled. I want the cold water so that I found this. Uh, I'm not going to uh, listen. I'm not going to simp for the brand because they're not uh, they're not paying the bills here. But I found a certain brand that makes like the giant, you know, the insulated one oh, still in the gallon size. So I don't. I think this is classified as a weapon. I don't know about Jacob's biceps, but this is definitely classified as a weapon. And it leaks at least six of the 50 states and you can't fly with it on an airplane. So. You know, but still, you got to have it. Oh, uh, I just figured you'd have to put it up in the overhead compartment. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's get this show here. <laughs> Matt is, of course, as I mentioned, of Yahoo Sports, and he's also the creator of Reception Perception. And that is a, an interesting way to evaluate wide receivers that we're going to learn about as we go into the show. And Jacob, you know, what do you want to tell us about what's coming up today, who we're going to be talking about and the types of things we're going to be breaking down? Yeah, tons of uh, young wide receivers we're going to talk about today. I'm just so, so excited to have uh, Matt on. Matt is somebody that I've been following his work uh, for a long, long time. If I were to like vouch for anybody in the industry, I think Matt would be at the top of the list because I've been following him back since I was like in college trying to break into the industry back in the backyard banter days. A little uh, shout out for any of the old heads there. Um, just really, really respect the work that Matt's done. And what he does is he um, is able to really study the wide receiver position and quantify 
what's happening, what a wide receiver is doing independent of the results. So a lot of the times the stuff we're looking at just in the last episode, we talked to Pat Fitzmorris and uh, Matt Friedman about yard per route run data. And even yard per route run data as one of the most popular stats is focused on the results. There's so much that happens on the quarterback side of things, on the coaching side of things that influences the numbers that we get. But with Matt's data, what's so cool about it is that a lot of those outside factors don't come into play. We don't have to play guessing games about how good DJ Moore or Allen Robinson might be if they had a competent quarterback. Matt can just tell us how good they are at getting open. Um, it's really it's really cheat codes, reception perception is. Um, so just so, so excited to have Matt on and pick his brain about all these wide receivers. We're going to get into Devonta Smith, uh, AJ Brown for sure, Christian Watson, you mentioned Drake London for sure, just like tons of of excited young guys. The, the wide receiver position is so cool right now. Um, I've heard Matt mention that. There's just so much young talent. So uh, tons of guys to dive into. Um, and Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I appreciate you, Jacob. Uh, although you did make me feel old saying, you know, you listened to my stuff back in in college and uh, when you're <laughs> trying to break in. So very rarely do I feel like the old man, but I do. And uh, I, but I appreciate it, man. And yeah, I, you're so right. Like even putting together a show like this and we've got a ton to talk about, there's we could spend like five hours i mean again this is what yeah. i spend most of my time doing thinking about the wide receiver position because there's it's just stocked right now and you know i just did an article for yahoo like the best wide receivers ranked 25 and under or aged uh, 25 and under like top 15 guys uh, heading into week one and you can't go through an exercise like that and and not feel like you slighted somebody you left somebody off the list and and again that's guys that are 25 and under it's like what about the dudes that have been doing this for a long time it, it is a it, it's a great position to talk about right now so i'm excited yeah i was reading that earlier today and i guess um let me start out because i want to talk about a lot of players and i let me ask you about michael Pittman. he was higher on that list mm -hmm. than usual and i think you stressed in the article though those are not fantasy rankings right mm -hmm. correct yeah yeah just pure like ability as players and and of course and you know it's not to like derail the entire thing here, but that is really hard too. Cause how do you compare guys like that are in a certain archetype of wide receivers and that do different things than, you know, some of these other guys. So it's a tough list uh, to make. And like I said, you can't do it without feeling like ah, I really, I really slighted this one guy, but yeah, just pure ability as players, not like within the context of their situations, fantasy, stuff like that. So you had Pittman 11th uh, on this list of wide receivers under the, is it under the, I'm sorry, under the age of 25 or 25? 25, 25 and under, yeah. That will be 25, like A.J. Brown is 25 right in this moment, but he turns 26 in June. So it was just guys that are going to be 25 and under during the season. Um, yeah, so you have him like ahead of Amandra St. Brown. What kind of a player do you think Michael Pittman is? Is he a guy who do you think he can make more plays? I know we talked about him last week on Beyond the Box Score, someone who, we thought was just misused with the extremely low a dot of basically everyone on the Colts last year. And I think you call, you know, we talked about him being in the intermediate range with our guests last week, but um, you know, from a fantasy standpoint, I'm not very high on him because of the Anthony Richardson factor, but what do you think about Michael Pittman? Why was he, he was, I, I don't know if he was higher on this list than I expected. I hadn't really thought about the list, but uh, just that one jumped out to me ahead of Amonra St. Brown, ahead of Drake London, ahead of Jahan Dotson. Again, in not in fantasy rankings, but Matt, your thoughts on Michael Pittman. I'm such a big Michael Pittman fan, um, mostly because I do love these guys that are really good in the intermediate range. You know, going into last season, I called him a kind of a hybrid in, in reception perception. Like if you look at his profile compared to these two guys, sort of like a hybrid of Keenan Allen and Allen Robinson when he was at his prime, because we, you know, we could definitely see the big perimeter wide receiver stuff, you know, the ability to work downfield in contested situations. But I also think he is a incredible route runner on like slants, digs, curls, like those in breaking routes that are just like, you're going to pile up a ton of targets. And we did see a lot of that last year with Matt Ryan. It's kind of funny because I think the last two years with Michael Pittman, we've seen Carson Wentz be able to really get the best out of him from a downfield ball winner contested catch uh, standpoint. But I was looking for when watching that season, it's like I'm looking for somebody that's more going to exploit him, uh, get the most out of him on those base NFL in breaking routes, crossers, digs, slants, uh, stuff like that. And then it was kind of all the way on the other extreme with Matt Ryan last year, where there was none of that downfield jump ball stuff and only like the in breaking short routes, especially like almost nothing in the intermediate range. So, 
I'm hoping that at some point during Anthony Richardson's career, you know, if Michael Pittman stays with the Colts and everything, you know, works out, that we can get him to sort of meet Michael Pittman in the middle here. But I do think he is really an underrated separator. You know, you look at his last few years in reception perception, excellent scores against man coverage and press coverage and zone coverage as well. Like he checks a lot of the boxes I'm looking for for a true number one receiver. I just think he is like at the top of the list of guys that have just been uh, you know, unfortunate with their quarterback pairings of late. Which might again be the case. Do, are you going to be higher on Michael Pittman than consensus? I'm looking right now at fantasy pros, uh, PPR consensus rankings. Actually, this is standard scoring, uh, but in standard score, well, I'll just do PPR. Michael Pittman is wide receiver 24, which is interesting because he's 32 in non PPR makes sense. I mean, you expect catches from him, but I still think that's kind of high. I'm not sure. I'd be lower on him than that, personally. Jerry Judy, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Lockett behind him. I mean, the first two for sure I'd have ahead of him. But where do you think where are you going to end up on, on Pittman? And then Jacob, I'd like your opinion too. I think I'll probably have him right around that 24 to 30 range. Again, it's just tough because there are so many good receivers. Like I would definitely take um I'd definitely take Calvin Ridley over him. I'd probably take Tyler Lockett over him as well. And the funny thing about like always oh, Pitt, like Pittman is a better PPR receiver than standard receiver. I, I could like kind of what I just said. I think that, you know, he almost caught a hundred passes last year because he was working with a quarterback that could absolutely not push the ball downfield. And, and he is a really good route runner in those areas, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he's like a, you know, 70 catch, uh, you know, high a dot wide receiver this year, because he does have that complete skill set. And uh, I, I think Anthony Richardson, obviously, we, we don't know what he's going to look like. So it is really tough, man. But I, I'll tell you this. I, I really find myself intrigued with this Colts offense overall, especially this receiver core, right? Like if Anthony Richardson is good, I think they have an extremely complimentary three receiver set with Alec Pierce, who is a limited player. But, I mean, he can run slants, posts, and goes from that X receiver position and win the ball downfield. And then I think that Michael Pittman's like your perfect number one that you can move around the formation in sort of a Keenan Allen type of way. And I love Josh. I mean, I love Josh Downs as like a slot receiver as well. So it's hard to not get super high on Anthony Richardson just because I'm such a believer in those receivers. But yeah, for Michael Pittman in fantasy, I could easily see him. You know, a lot of folks in, in the reception perception discord have pointed this out. Like he might be a guy in dynasty to buy like in the middle of the season when Anthony Richardson starts slow, maybe they're not throwing the ball much and then try to get in on him like in the middle of the year when he's not been as productive. I could totally see that happening this year. Yeah, uh, Jacob, you're th- and, and you're right. I, I should say I shouldn't say that Pittman should definitely be higher in PPR because that that was a last year thing and they're going to have a much different offense this year. Um, so thanks for pointing that out. Jacob, your thoughts on Pittman and then we'll get into some. Uh, some more breakout, so some breakout calls and the coverage data and all that stuff. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, I'll just echo everything Matt said. I love Josh Downs. I love the fit for the receivers there. I think it might be a slow start um, with Anthony Richardson and those guys we've seen. Um, rookie quarterbacks have really been detrimental for the fantasy receivers in their first year. Um, and then also rushing quarterbacks have kind of sucked the life out of offenses um, for fantasy typically. Um and so I'm a little bit hesitant this year. I like the the call to wait and maybe buy Pittman um, during the year for Dynasty. Um, but yeah, I've got him at wide receiver 28. I think where you had him ranked in that 24 range, um, Adam, where you said his ADP was is too high. All right. Uh, so Matt, I want to ask you before we get into the coverage stuff, or maybe we can incorporate the coverage stuff, the the schemes and the metrics and what you've seen. Um, got any? Got a couple of uh, wide receiver breakouts you're looking forward to drafting this year? Yeah, so I always like when I get this question to start with, I think, the most obvious breakout candidate for me that is not going to be like a unique take, but, you know, reception perception certainly backs it up. I think that's going to be Drake London this year. Um, I know there are questions with the offense, obviously. Uh, I, I have become one of the, at least in the fantasy industry, one of the foremost Arthur Smith backers. Uh, I, I really love the way the Falcons offense is designed from a from a pass concept standpoint. Um, I think he does a great job of putting guys in position to succeed. I think they also had, uh, and you know, you got. I think you can blame Arthur Smith a little bit uh, for this because they had a, a history together, uh, being Marcus Mariota. I, I think they had one of the the worst starting quarterbacks, you know, non Zach Wilson division last year in Marcus Mariota in terms of accurately getting guys the football, being able to you know make plays on time. But Drake London, when you isolate him in reception perception, you know, this is a guy going back to 
his collegiate profile. There was a lot of questions about can this guy separate uh, at the you know even as a collegiate player in, in during uh, his time at USC because he was in a lot of contested situations. But part of what I, I love doing with reception perception is like why is he in those contested situations? Is he not separating or? Does he have a bad quarterback that, again, at USC maybe is not getting him the ball on time in these routes and throwing him into contested situations? We like to call this the Taylor Heineke factor. Uh, <laughs> you know, shout out to ODU's finest, but uh, that is certainly uh, his, his pairing with Terry McLaurin there. But when you look at Drake London as a rookie, 72.3% success rate versus man coverage, 81.6% success rate versus zone, 72.5% against press coverage like he shows you that ability he honestly is is kind of similar to Michael Pittman where he's a big receiver that can be a ball winner as a true x on the outside but he's really good on those in breaking routes over the middle which is so crucial in this offense so I think if Desmond Ritter is just functional like he's he's a functional starting NFL quarterback you know maybe like a at poor man's Ryan Tannehill type obviously for this offense I think we can get a really big season out of Drake London who I think showed last year even when him and Kyle Pitts were on the field together like I think the routes that Drake London runs and the way he plays is just a little bit more quarterback friendly than than what you're going to look for as like a vertical uh tight end option with Kyle Pitts there so I'm really high on Drake London I think he's an obvious breakout candidate um I do think that like again like what is a breakout I'm super high on Jahan Dotson as a breakout candidate this year like if Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett are good I'm sure we'll talk about Dotson later Elijah Moore also another guy that I, I still have a lot of faith on uh, as a breakout player if he really wins a, a two receiver set role there in Cleveland so those are kind of some guys that I think could make a leap in fantasy this year Drake London being the guy that like I think we hopefully all realize is really good uh I think if the, if everything comes together situationally there he should be I, he could easily be a thousand yard receiver this year with no question about it. Man, it's everyone. Lo I get it. I mean, I, I love, I love them. Everybody loved him coming out of college, right? He's the first wide receiver drafted in a very good wide receiver class. It's just, we all have the same concerns. It's just, are they going to throw the ball enough? His best production last year came without Kyle Pitts. How good is Desmond Ritter? I actually think Desmond Ritter is a pretty interesting kind of two QB sleeper. I don't think he'll throw enough to be, a one QB mm -hmm. guy, but you know, he, he can run and was watching a little bit of his tape yesterday. And I don't know, you know, you've watched a lot more than I have. I don't think he's bad or anything. It's just, yeah, it's just a matter of, uh, of volume. So mm -hmm. he's so interesting. He's going to really frustrate me. I, I hope he becomes a value at some point, but you know, they got Bijan now it's just, there's like, there's not a lot of mouths to feed, but there it's just hard for me to get excited about that passing game, I guess. So how do you, and by the way, two questions. How do you balance your excitement about a player and his offensive environment, I guess in this case with Drake London and what's going to be a run-heavy team with a second-year quarterback with very little NFL experience um, and distracted Bijan? And then also those metrics you were throwing out, the success rates against different types of coverage. How do you get those? So, yeah, with the success rates, I'm literally just going in and charting them as individual players. You know, that's the goal of reception perception. Like Jacob mentioned up at the top, even advanced wide receiver stats, you know, yards per route run, yards per route run, diverse different coverages. You're in order to get the yards, you're taking in the variable of quarterback, of the offense, everything like that. So, you know, a guy could be getting open against man coverage, but if he doesn't have a good quarterback to, to push him the ball, though, some of those metrics might not look as good. So, with Reception perception, what I'm doing is literally just going in over an eight-game sample and charting everything that's happening, you know, how often these guys get open against certain coverages because that's, I think, the one thing a wide receiver can control. And, and you know, by the way, it's not – there are guys, you know, certainly that – run vertical routes and are not going to get open on some of these like clear out patterns. But uh, I think that some of that stuff comes out in the wash and in, in the long term. it's, I do think that reception perception is one of the only, if if not the only receiver metric that is going to isolate these guys as much as possible. But like you said, when we're, we're doing fantasy, you need to take in all those other variables. Like a guy can be really great as a player but he needs everything else to come together. So for me, it's like after I chart all this data out, I also like to, you know, ruin my life a little bit more uh, and do, do like full league wide projections, you know, because I think that just keeps you honest, you know, but like I could think that a guy is a you know, Terry McLaurin is a great example. I think Terry McLaurin is like a top 10 NFL receiver talent. 
But I'm not going to rank Terry McLaurin as a top 10 fantasy receiver because of the offensive environment, the quarterback play that he's with. So you definitely have to take in some context of their situation, of course, when you're when you're doing fantasy. So um, I might end up being higher on consensus on some of these guys that reception perception likes in fantasy because I do think talent sometimes dictates volume and situation. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to sober yourself a little bit here. All right, give me one more breakout, then we'll take a break, and then we'll get into uh, some of the data that Jacob wants to dive into. Yeah, definitely. Like I mentioned, Elijah Moore is a guy I'm really high on, but I would also point out another um, third-year receiver now uh, in Rashad Bateman. This is a health uh, situation as well, but, man, I mean, Bateman is such a good player. Uh, Even last year, you saw, like, it's not a coincidence that Lamar Jackson's, uh, you know, completely fell off the cliff. Uh, after Rashad Bateman started getting injured, you know, and he's a guy that didn't really deal with a ton of health problems in college. He's one of the many uh, folks that spoke out about or, or seemed upset with the, you know, Ravens training staff, right? That we know they got the F minus or whatever, uh, or the strength and conditioning staff got the F minus and the NFLPA thing. So hopefully he stays healthy this year because I think this guy has all of the talent that you're looking for in terms of being like an outside receiver. And Adam, this is a great example of a of a situation where. I think Odell Beckham might have still have something left. I really liked Zay Flowers as a prospect. Obviously, I'm still high on Bateman. Got to sober yourself a little bit, right, when in the Ravens offense, even if Todd Monken takes this thing to another level. So I'm interested to see where I actually end up ranking these guys in terms of fantasy. I obviously I haven't done that, you know, fully yet or, or done it in a real, like, committed way uh, yet. So I'm interested to see once I come out with all the reception perception, once I do the projections where I rank these guys, but I'm telling you, if Bateman stays healthy, I think he could easily be the best receiver on this roster. And I do think the Ravens offense is going to evolve to some degree without Greg Roman in the mix. Uh, quick follow-up. Do you think Bateman will be the best wide receiver or could be the best wide receiver or the best receiver in general? Will he outproduce Mark Andrews? I think that would be a little bit of a stretch to see him outproduce Mark Andrews, but I I think it's a little bit it's a little bit presumptuous for like the entire industry to just say like oh you know we're all they're all fighting for second like I, I do think that Bateman's talented enough to to be the top like pass catcher on the team. I also think Zay Flowers is talented enough to be the top pass catcher on the team, and if you know it's Beckham is such a wild card his. The last time we saw him in reception perception 2021, his date is pretty good, you know, it, 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 but who knows what he's going to be like now a year and a half later from that and, and everything, uh, another injury. I think that Mark Andrews is a really good tight end and a very good player, but typically you want to run your offense through wide receivers, not necessarily through tight ends. So it wouldn't like, I know that people hate when you say this, like kind of analysis like I wouldn't be surprised if one of these guys ends up being better than Mark Andrews but I'm certainly not going to pr- project it that way do I, I think it's within the range of outcomes though that's for sure all right quick break here Jacob has a lot of metrics he wants to dive into we have a question here from Alyssa about Chris Olave he's someone I believe we'll be talking about in a little bit I'm extremely excited about Chris Olave Jacob uh get ready you're up when we come back and we are back all right Jacob let's get into some metrics here let's start with some coverage schemes what do you want to talk about uh, yeah, we'll start with zone coverage, um, just because zone coverage is the most prevalent uh, coverage type in the NFL. Uh, the use of man coverage is on the decline over the past few years. So in 2020, uh, the league average man coverage rate was 31%. Last year, that was 24%. Um, only six teams had a man coverage rate above 30% last year. Compare that to 17 teams in 2020. So we're really seeing a change. Um, Matt, I've, I've heard you talk about on your podcast, the use of all this uh, cover two deep safety stuff. Um, And so we know that zone coverage typically leads to shorter passing and more targets at the running back and tight end position. Um, I just wanted to ask you if there's anything beyond those tendencies that you wanted to expand on with zone um, and any specific players you wanted to mention uh, in reference to zone coverage. Yeah. I mean, you're right. And, and reception perception, I should note, I started collecting league wide data in 2014. And even if you go back in like the historical databases, like some of the, like the, the guys that face the most press and man coverage, usually that was like X receivers five, six years ago, right? Like the, this, the way that the league has gone coverage wise has totally changed. Um, now you definitely get more man coverage, press coverage in like high leverage situations, third down man coverage rates rise, you know, in the red zone uh, you can see, especially like closer to the, the goal line, you can see man coverage rise. So it is still very important. I actually think it's, 
quote, more important uh, than, than zone coverage success rate. However, you know, there are guys that Amon Ross St. Brown's a great example in his rookie year. He cleared that 80% success rate versus zone coverage um, metric threshold that I, I like to see for guys in reception perception, but he was not necessarily the best performer against man and press coverage as a rookie. Now he took a leap this past year and, and that's borne out in the data as well. However, like, I was really high on him as a guy that I think is a true target earner because there is still, while you can scheme guys open against zone coverage, uh, you, you it is still a skill to be able to know. Um, it, it is still like a cover, like a skill to be able to know when to sit down, when to stop your routes, like timing routes and zone coverage, especially when you're mixed with a good uh, quarterback there. So I, I think that when you look at a player like that, who this is another thing, Jacob, that's changed with the rise in zone coverage. I think you also have seen sort of the rise in these, power slot players um for example saint brown is a is a great example you know a guy that is almost i've called him bud like cooper cup uh, even before he was drafted by the lions and it was great to see him drafted by the team that a front office that came from the rams the team that drafted cooper cup so i think those guys are it's important for them to be able to beat zone coverage because they're going to face a lot more zone over the middle stuff like that so and that's another thing too it's it's i i don't know how necessarily the how other ch services uh, kind of level it off in terms of zone coverage across the entire defense. Cause there are situations where like a number one receiver will get man coverage, but then the rest of the, the defense is still more in a softer zone. Uh, so it's interesting to see. I don't know how other services do that. Cause I'm just charting one player in his one individual matchup, but uh, yeah, I, long winded answer there to say that, uh, you know, these guys that are big slot receivers, it's really important for them uh, to be able to be able to beat zone coverage and know when to sit down versus it. Yeah, for sure. We've got, if you're watching on YouTube, we've got a graphic up here that points to just that fact, big slot receiver, Debo Samuel, um, and a bunch of running backs and tight ends are the other guys. Another big slot and Chris Godwin. So the chart we've got here is showing the target per route run run uh, rate differences when facing zone coverage on the right or man coverage on the left. And so like the players who stand out the most is like Austin Eckler, 32% target per route run rate versus zone compared to just 18% versus man. So it's just something important to know when you're facing these really zone heavy coverage schemes during the season, your tight ends, your running backs can be targeted at a much higher rate. Uh, uh, Okonkwo from the Titans almost double um, his target per route run rate when facing zone as uh, opposed to man coverage. Um, and it's just, it's, it's interesting because I think you and I, Matt would agree that in terms of looking for signals um, and, and in terms of looking for something that might be potentially useful in evaluating wide receivers specifically down the line, we kind of lean towards the man and press coverage rates, right? Like being able to beat mm -hmm. those type of coverage is what we care about the most. Yeah, it, it definitely in terms of uh, signaling, like who are good players, these eventual breakouts, stuff like that. Um, but I, I would also say like, again, bringing it back to where these guys line up, which is it's funny, like it, it it gets more talked about now, but I, I remember doing, you know, reception perception like a few years ago and, I was even not really giving credit to like a, a great example is a guy like Juju Smith Schuster, who, you know, when he, he and Antonio Brown were together in that 2018 season, there was um, some, some discourse, you know, about like, is Juju taking a leap past Antonio Brown? Like, see, because he's younger in his per route stat rates and stuff like that is per target stat rates. Is he actually the better receiver on the team, even though we all knew AB was really good. But it's like these guys might as well be playing different positions was my point back then. Like what mm. Juju was doing as a big power slot receiver and the coverages he was facing is so different than a, a true, you know, Hall of Fame level type of X receiver in Antonio Brown, who's like a pure man press coverage beater. But that's not to say necessarily that like Juju is not good or anything like that. It just where these guys line up is where you have to start the question. So um, for Zone coverage, you know, uh, Josh Scott, who's a subscriber to Reception Perception and a data scientist, he's done some work for us on, on this. And there's an article on the site if you go to free content uh, and, and look at what matters in Reception Perception, the tab there uh, on the site. He wrote a great detailed article uh, about how zone coverage success rate definitely matters more for those slot receivers than it does for outside receivers, whereas man and press coverage is certainly more important. So on a general rule, yeah, I definitely think that man coverage is more important. Uh, it's a better signal in terms of like player quality. However, these guys that if St. Brown, right? Like as a rookie, if he's a really good zone coverage beater, not as much of a good man coverage beater, I'm not going to dock him for that because mm -hmm. of where he lines up in the role that he plays. Yeah. 
on that note, now we we've got a different graph showing um, which players were the most effective in drawing targets versus man coverage as opposed to zone. You'll see Drake London at the top of that list, 37% target per route run rate versus man coverage last year that tied Tyree kill for the highest in the NFL uh, just behind him. Jamar chase. We're going to get into him and T Higgins for sure here. Um, but also I think as- big up Jay. So we're looking at something right now. If you're listening, mm-hmm. talking about players who are, who had, the biggest splits, basically, in terms of their ability to draw targets per route run against man. They were very good there, and they had a, a, a dip uh, against zone. But yeah. we, these are mostly outside receivers here. It, right. Yeah, right. that's what I was so going to say. Is I think we want to see them you know, get a lot of targets against man, based on what you guys were just saying. So it's Drake London, Jamar Chase, Mike Williams, Christian Watson. These guys had, you know, big splits in terms of getting they got a lot more targets against man covers than they did against zone. Further down on the list, Ayuk, Sutton, Mike Evans, Alec Pierce, Tyquan Thornton. Okay, I just wanted to set it up here and kind of mm-hmm. recap. Go ahead, Jacob. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, just a you'll notice a similarity between these receivers. They're typically high A dot guys that are playing mostly in the X or from the perimeter mm-hmm. and stretching the field. That's their role. And so when they face his own heavy schemes, I mean, look at some of these target per round rates. Tyquan Thor and Alec Pierce, they're, they're basically ignored. Um, and I just wanted to point this out um, and just help further contextualize the difference between the coverage types and the types of receivers that are benefiting in these. Um, and I think we're good now to just go ahead and transition into some specific. Well, actually, can I make one more point yeah. about this, this group of guys is, and I think this gets lost during the, during the fantasy season when it's like, we just talk about outside receiver and slot receiver. Mm-hmm. This guy, like you mentioned, Jacob, I mean, Drake London, Jamar Chase, Mike Williams, Brandon Ayuk, Cortland Sutton, Mike Evans, uh, Alec Pierce, like Thornton and Watson, Tyquan Thornton and Christian Watson, um, are really the only two guys on this list that aren't just like pure X receivers. Now, Jamar Mm -hmm. Chase is interesting because they have another guy who's like a prototypical X receiver in T. Higgins that they're able to split that up a little bit. But literally almost everybody else on this list is a pure X receiver. And and not to like dilute the alignment conversation even more, but there's a huge difference between what you're asking of your true X receiver, you know, a guy that does not move around, like, cause you are tethered on the line of scrimmage. You are not like going to move around pre-snap. Um, and then like that, you're going to face a lot more man coverage. You're going to draw a lot more targets against man coverage. So if you want a guy that's going to be an X receiver, you know, like a, a Brandon Ayuk is a great example. Like he's the only one in that offense that really isn't like moved around pre-snap is like not schemed up touches. He has to be a great man press coverage beater. He is, by the way. Uh, and, and and so it's really important to be that guy. But then if you're a flanker receiver and you uh, – that's why it's – again, I think this is so important when why I chart it for reception perception is on the site – not just how often are they outside, but how often are they on the line versus on the line? Because if they're a off the line player in like a flanker and two receiver sets or a flanker and 11 personnel, it's okay if they're not as much of a man coverage beater and they're more of a zone coverage beater. Then so it just it again, not to dilute the, the whole like coverage thing even further, but it really matters a lot where these guys line up. And I just want to make that point about this list. It, it stick the first thing that sticks out to me looking at it is at least uh, all but three of these guys and really like I'd say all but two and a half because Chase is just a a unique situation. These are all like true X receivers that aren't moving around pre-snap. Do you have any examples of guys who are the clear cut like flanker and don't have to be as good against man coverage? Like Elijah Moore maybe comes to mind. Um, Do you have anybody else like that? Elijah Moore comes to mind. Um, You know, Robert Woods was a great example Mm. back in the day with the Rams. Um, like I, it's, nobody, nobody likes this stuff as much as I do. So that's fair. But uh, <laughs> like a guy uh, that, that Rams three receiver set in 2018, Brandon cooks, your vertical X uh, Robert Woods, your flanker and Cooper cup, your big slot. That's just like so perfectly complimentary. It, it, it really gets the juices flowing. Jacoby Myers is a guy that's like that too, who plays a lot of slot, but he's a flanker in two receiver sets, which is why his zone coverage success rate is really important. And then like, okay, let me give you an actually exciting name here. Jahan Dotson is a great mm, example yeah. of a guy who like Terry McLaurin's their pure X love Terry McLaurin. Um, but then Jahan Dotson's a guy who was kind of profiled as a slot receiver. Uh, like he, he's going to ha- he's going to have to play in the slot because of his size, this, that, and the other, but he really mostly played outside last year, but was off the ball and mostly a flanker receiver. So his zone coverage success rate is a really important one as well. Yeah, very exciting stuff we saw with Dotson. Um, and on that note, I want to transition to the man coverage data that we have. So we're going to dig into and start with the rookie receiver class. Because what we saw 
last year from this rookie class was just insane. And so what we've got here, the graphic we got pulled up for our YouTube watchers is rookie season yard per route run rates versus man coverage leaders. Um, and this is with a minimum of just 50 routes, which is very small. Um, but you've got Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase up there at the top. And then the next thing on that list is Christian Watson. Um, and it's way too small of a sample size, I think, to be like Christian Watson's almost as good as Jamar Chase, but it just goes to show like how exciting the potential is for Watson. Um, and then we also, with his rookie class, had um, top 30 yard per route run rates versus man coverage from Garrett Wilson, Chris Alave, Drake London, and Traylon Burks. Um, those guys were all higher. Those were guys were all more efficient um, versus man coverage than Cooper Cup, Devonta Adams, and Terry McLaurin last year. Um, and we're dealing with small sample size when it comes to Burks, when it comes to Watson. So don't you know get carried away with this. But um, Matt, I just wanted to, to ask you specifically what you thought about the rookie wide receiver class, um, specifically with Watson and Burks, um, because I think their data here is probably a little bit misleading because of the small sample size. But what are you seeing about from those guys against man coverage? Yeah, man. I mean, <laughs> those this rookie receiver class was really good last year. Uh, we've had a lot of really good classes the last few years, like I mentioned with that 25 and under uh, ranking, why it's so hard. Because 2020 was great. 2021 was great. 2022 was really awesome as well. Um, especially those three guys at the top. Uh, I think Olave, London, and Wilson are so good. Uh, I'm so bullish on them. Uh, the other two guys, like you know Watson and, and Burks, Let's, let me start with Christian Watson because I think Watson's a great example of a guy that like the, the Packers used him at both X and flanker last year. Um, he took 37% of his sampled snaps off the line. He was on the line for 63%. So definitely more was more of a flanker later on, or more of a um, X receiver later on in the season as he got his feet wet. But early on in the year, they definitely used him off the line to kind of be more of a coverage dictating matchup type guy. And he's a really good vertical route runner. Like if you look at his route success rate on nines, post goes, uh, the corner route, the out route, he's great at that. And those are his most commonly run routes in addition to the flat route, like just being a simple guy that you get off in space. Um, I compared him to Martavis Bryant as a prospect. And I feel really good about that comparison after his rookie year, because He's not a complete receiver. You know, you look at his man coverage success rates, 33rd percentile, his uh, zone coverage success rate, 37th percentile. He's got to get better as like a full field route runner to be a true number one receiver. But I think what we see from him as a rookie, you know, kind of similar to like Juju, like he's really high on this list as well. I, don't, I definitely don't think Juju is a, a true number one receiver and he didn't ever develop on the like the rest of the spectrum in terms of being an outside guy, being a guy who's going to win down the field, almost actually in the inverse way where uh, Christian Watson is, more of a downfield route runner the, than he is on like base NFL routes, like slants, digs, uh, curls, stuff like that. But you saw some flashes from Watson. Again, I think the Martavis Bryant comparison I feel really good about because he can stretch the field, but he's really freaky after the catch. And I do think from a ball skills perspective, like we're not talking about route running here. I think he got better uh, as the year went on in terms of winning and contested situations and stuff like that. So I, I definitely think he is, like, I think there's a tier uh, – if I'm tiering this rookie receiver class from last year, I think there's a tier one of Olave, Wilson, London. Honestly, you could put those guys in any order. I'm not going to really fight you about it because I love all three of them. And then I think, like, Jahan Dotson sort of in the next tier down, almost like kind of by himself. Ooh. And then we get into the Watson, Burks, Pickens zone there next. And um, for Burks, like you mentioned – He's a, he's a really tough evaluation because I don't want to be too hard on him with how things went last year because like I can't stress this enough. The role that he played as a rookie was almost completely different, like a totally different position than what he did in college. Like yeah. as a collegiate player, he was almost in this like fake gimmicky type of role. Uh, he was in the backfield a ton, you know, as a as a collegiate player in his reception perception sample, he took 80.5% of his snaps in the slot or in the backfield and 84% of his sampled snaps off the line. As a rookie, uh, Burks was on the line on 75% of his snaps and he was outside on 83.5%. Like that's a complete flip of what he was doing. So he's, I said coming into the league, he was going to be a developmental X receiver and the line, I mean the lines, the, the Titans basically just threw him out there at that position and let him develop on, on the fly. But he's really only good on like two routes at this point, like uh, just crossing routes, like dig routes, slant routes, and that's about it. Like, and, and he's made a lot of plays on those particular uh, two routes, but we need to see a lot of development from a player like that if he's going to be uh, 
able to reach the potential I think a lot of uh, folks still have for him. Yeah. All right, that's uh, Traylon and Burks we're talking about. I mean, we got to – first of all, those, those tiers that you just gave, those are not fantasy tiers, right? They're just your – Right, yeah, just as, just as players, yeah. Um, Jahan Dotson by himself uh, behind London Olave. Yes. That, that we got to talk about that, Jacob. That, that jumped out to me. What did you think about that, Jacob? That's why I love having Matt on because that is such a contrarian take from people who get so much of their influence through the fantasy landscape, the fantasy scope. Like, I think most people would clearly think of Watson as being ahead of Dotson. Um, but Hayden Wings from uh, Underdog Fantasy just put out his um, tiers, and he also had Watson a little bit lower and Dotson a little bit higher. And I think people who are really watching – Dots in play believe that he's clearly the next best receiver after the top three. And that's just like why it's so, so fun to get Matt's perspective on this because yeah. what he, what Dotson did last year is really, really exciting. And so for dynasty purposes, I think you take note here. Yeah. Well, and, and this, this receiver core is good too, man. In Washington, that receiver core is so fun. It's another one like really gets the juices flowing. Cause it's a, uh, it's so complimentary. And, you know, I'll say with, with John Dotson, probably the most impressive note from his rookie profile 78.9% success rate versus press. That's an 87th percentile all-time reception perception score. Wow. Um, he just gets open. And, like, by the way, the most exciting thing about Jahan Dotson is that he's, like, 5'11", sub-190 pounds. And he's one of the best contested catch receivers in the NFL right now. Uh, like, that was a trump card trait that he had in college and it was it translated immediately uh for his games recept sampled for reception perception saw a contested target on 22 percent of his sampled looks and won 81.8 percent of those targets i mean great hands great timing he's just a pure technician and i love those technicians man so it, like he's a guy that uh if he and if you just look at like a base stat standpoint it's really not that like far off what Jahan Dotson even did from Christian Watson in his rookie year and i mean look at the quarterbacks that Jahan Dotson uh played with versus uh you know Aaron Rodgers for Christian Watson i mean he's a he's a good player and i think if they if they ever figured out a quarterback in Washington i think that's going to be a good offense so how about your fantasy rankings though and you know it's funny i i i'm looking at my notes on Dotson from 2022 going into the NFL draft and I wrote I think he knows how to get open and that was something that kept popping up to me it's like this guy just just watching the games he's just open he just knows how to he's just looked like a very smart football player so I'm glad to see that 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 is translated and you said he's really great at getting open and uh, that is something that Dan Schneier has talked about a lot is, is a really important skill that people are paying more attention to now, thanks to people like Matt Harmon, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but from a fantasy standpoint, I know how much you love Terry McLaurin. We have obviously so many questions about Sam Howell and what, and if it's even going to be him, by the way, at quarterback. Yeah. Um, so how do you rank? Like, Who are your top five fantasy sophomore wide receivers? Yeah, I think I'm going to go oh – God, the, the top three is tough. I think you have to go Wilson first just because, look, he's he's going to be paired with Aaron Rodgers. I also think, like you – know, we haven't talked about those guys specifically yet, but I, like Garrett Wilson has some superstar notes in his reception perception profile from his rookie year. Um, I could pull one of them up as I filibuster a little more. But, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at a guy in Garrett Wilson that, like, truly, I, again, he does have a superstar ceiling. So does Chris Olave. Like, I think Olave is absolutely up there. But – in the best indicator from uh, Garrett Wilson's rookie season was his 81.2% success rate versus press coverage. That's a 94th percentile score. Here are the receivers that wow. as rookies cleared 80% success rate versus press coverage in reception perception history. Like I said, dating back to 2014. CeeDee Lamb, Michael Thomas, Tyreek Hill, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Odell Beckham, and now Garrett Wilson. Only seven dudes. Not a bad list. <laughs> Not Pretty a bad list, list. Of <laughs> to be on, right? So I, I think Garrett Wilson right now, he's also really freaky after the catch. Like he is kind of like what the Kadarius Tony bros wish Kadarius Tony was. That's actually what Garrett Wilson is because he's freaky after the catch and he is a really good route runner as well. So I think you got to have him number one. Chris Olave, 75% uh, success rate versus man. Very important threshold indicator there. He cleared that bar, and he also did it not running like any Mickey Mouse routes. He was all like running all vertical routes, so he's number two for me. Um, I like his pairing with Derek Carr. Uh, I think Derek Carr showed us last year that he can be um, – him and Delonte Adams made some music in the intermediate area of the field. That's the best area Chris Olave runs his routes. I think that's a natural pairing there. I think he has a really high ceiling. Then number three is Drake London to me. Adam, all of your concerns about the offense, I think, from a volume standpoint, are super valid. But 
I do think the efficiency of this offense can be really good because they're so talented. They have a good offensive line. I like Arthur Smith as a play caller. So he's number three to me. Um, this is where I think it gets a little murky, but I'm probably going to have – I'm probably going to have Christian Watson there because I think from a fantasy angle, like the routes that he's best on, uh, the the slant uh, – I mean, excuse me, the, the, the post route, the nine route, the corner route, those are all big play routes. And, you know, by the way, he is – exceptional in the open field as well so uh you know look we don't know what jordan love is you know i think Jaden reed's a really good player that i'm high on but that's a young receiver room and i think christian watson's the most dangerous so give me him at four um and then five i'm gonna put Jahan dotson over Traylon burks just because number one like they might sign deandre hopkins i think they kind of need to sign deandre hopkins tennessee titans there so um just give me john dotson there because i think he um he could like the quarterback situation. Certainly, Sam Howell's unproven. Jacoby Brissett's a pretty steady player, uh, though, if he gets the starting job. So I feel pretty comfortable having Jahan Dotson third there. Um, I just, I, there's a lot more that I need to see from Burks to kind of pencil or write in pen the breakout there. All right. Let's take a break here. We have a little bit more to talk about here uh, with Matt Harmon and Jacob Gibbs. This is Beyond the Box Score, and we'll be right back. Okay. Back for our final time here, our final segment. It's happy Friday, guys, by the way. Ready for the weekend? Oh, yeah. Uh, sun, sun's out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, finally, the hay, the uh, smoke is clearing here in New York. So looking forward to uh, the great outdoors. Um, all right. So, uh, let's, Jacob, what's uh, what's next for us here as we transition? Yeah, so I want to bring up Jamar Chase and T. Higgins to get Matt's perspective on this. Um, I'm a little bit worried about T. Higgins. And if you have you know followed our work on FFT for a while, you know that I love T. Higgins over the past few years. Um, but I think we saw some concerning signs last year and mostly it was that Jamar has seems to truly be ascending into like Justin Jefferson level, just complete start and wide receiver one. Um, he was 99th percentile Jamar was in yards per hour run rate versus man coverage in 2021 and uh, sustained that in 2022. But what he uh, really improved on was his ability to draw targets um, versus man coverage all the way up to 98th percentile in 2022 from 63rd percentile as a rookie. Um, and we just saw across the board, Jamar was targeted in all different situations much more often as his average depth of target dropped and they incorporated him into more of a wide receiver one role. Um, and I'm, I'm worried about what that means for T Higgins. We did see a slight dip in Higgins um, ability to draw targets and his efficiency versus man coverage last year. Um, and then just overall, not even within the scope of man coverage, um, T Higgins target per row and rate was way down. He had an identical target per row and rate to Mike Evans um, and to Cortland Sutton. Uh, those are guys that just don't draw targets at a high rate, not guys that were super excited about for fantasy. And I think T Higgins is maybe falling into more of this risky wide receiver two type of role. Um, obviously the offense is so good that he's going to outproduce that most weeks. Um, but yeah, Matt, are, are you worried at all about T Higgins? Oh, the last thing I want to bring up is Jamar was doubled on 19% of his routes, Matt. I think I read on reception yeah. perception and only Justin Jefferson was doubled on a higher rate. If, and it's like, if T Higgins still isn't drawing the targets with Jamar being doubled like that, like, is that something we've got to be concerned about? Yeah. Let's first, let me say this about T Higgins as a player. You know, I ranked him seventh on that list. We mentioned up at the top, the Yahoo article, the guys that are 25 mm -hmm. and under um, love T Higgins as a player. His profile just hit reception perception.com yesterday. You know, he clears 70% success rate versus man and press, which is really important as a guy like, that is a true like, that has that X receiver archetype. He's that type of player. Um, so this is no shade to T Higgins, who also might be the best ball winner in the NFL. Like I think he's a true legit one B receiver and a guy that if he was playing for a bunch of other teams, he'd be the number one receiver. So he's a really good player. The problem is Jacob, like you mentioned, Jamar Chase is just really, really good. Like he's he's better. He's he's a top five receiver in the NFL right now. I think this is an absolutely insane reception perception note for Jamar Chase. And I guarantee I'm I'm gonna say this, and like nobody listening or, or watching is gonna geek out as, as much as I do. But this is really important. Chase has posted an exact seventy five point three percent success rate versus man coverage in his rookie and his sophomore season. He also cleared eighty percent success rate versus zone and press. Like that seventy five eighty. 80 that's the elite receivers in the nfl like if you go and look in the historic rp database that is like all your studs and he did all this while despite the fact that the nine route was his most frequently run route in both of his rookie and sophomore season like that is an insane level to get like the insane level to get open while running the most difficult route the one that has the lowest average success rate 
it is just nuts. And again, he's another guy who is a complete player. He doesn't have any holes in his game. He's great after the catch. He's a great 50 50 ball receiver. You know, I had a conversation with him a few months ago at the Super Bowl where we talked about like how good he is as a route runner technically and how much he is dedicated to that part of the game. He's he's just a great receiver that is like on a, an insane upward trajectory, the Justin Jefferson Justin Jefferson trajectory, as you mentioned, Jacob. So uh, that's the real reason to be like concerned about T. Higgins from a fantasy perspective is that as good of a player he as he is, defenses know Chase is the alpha. Def, like the the Bengals are starting to treat Chase like he's the clear clear alpha here. And again, that's no shade to T. Higgins' skill set. Who you know, I, I made this note in his reception perception profile like the double coverage met- metric that you mentioned jacob yeah like when they're on the field chase is getting those uh chase is getting those double teams he's getting the extra defensive attention however i included three games for higgins where chase wasn't playing and at least two of those three defenses like they doubled t higgins at a really high rate so that's the thing is like teams know that t higgins could be an alpha but only when Jamar Chase is like not there. So uh, that uh, it, I get, understand the concern there, and, but it's really just comes back to just how good of a player Chase is. I'm not even a little bit concerned about T. Higgins. I think he's one of the easiest draft picks uh, if you can get him in the third round. Because if it's 12 team league now in non PPR league, you might go crazy running back heavy, but half or full PPR. I know that you're right that t- about T. Higgins' upside, Jacob. I and mean, you make a good point. He's never going to be. I don't think he's ever going to be a top five wide receiver as long as Jamar Chase is on the field. That's not in the cards, but he could easily be top 15. And I think his floor is super high as well. If you look at what he did last year, he was wide receiver 21 per game, but he played three games where he barely played. He had two catches in those three games. They completely kill his per game averages for fantasy. But T Higgins to me, uh, yeah, his, his upside is capped because of Chase, but he is, he is going to be, such an easy third round pick. Once you start to get in the third round, you have to make some really tough choices, right? You have to like, I, I just took, I took Brees Hall late in the third round uh, yesterday in a, in a draft. Um, but you know, you might start seeing a guy like Jameer Gibbs creep up in there. You might see a guy like Drake London creep up in there. Uh, T Higgins to me is one of the most certain top 30 picks. I don't want to necessarily take him in the top 20, but late round two to mid round three in a 12 team league. He's, he's a layup for me, even though I know his upside is capped. I think he has one of the highest floors, of it. Like, I take him over Devontae Smith. I think he has a higher floor than Devontae Smith. And nah, it's, funny, it's funny you mentioned that, too, because, like, there's a ton of dudes in that tier of, of, of like, drafts. Jalen Waddell has the same problem. Devontae Smith, who you mentioned, has the same problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The good news for T. Higgins is that he's tethered to, I think, the best pure passer of those three. Uh, and, and, I mean, probably just the best quarterback period of those three. And he's such a great – he's just a great fit as a ball winner with Joe Burrow, who's like I probably think the best contested catch thrower in the NFL right now. So I, I'm with you, Adam, that like saying concerned about T. Higgins, again, it sounds too harsh. Uh, I just think, yeah, the point about the upside is, is fair. And Jacob, I'm sorry. I know you probably there's directions you want to go, but I cannot keep looking at a list that has Mike Williams – among the best in this category, right, and not talk about him. I mean, so we're looking at a list of wide receiver yard per route run leaders versus man coverage, which we've established as an outside receiver. If you're good against man coverage, I mean, that's a really good sign, right? And Mike Williams was second in yards per route run, minimum 100 routes behind Jamar Chase, ahead of A.J. Brown, ahead of Justin Jefferson. And, you know, he's got he's kind of – he's banged up right now, so – and they've got Quinton Johnston – and he's so inconsistent. He's one of the most annoying players in fantasy. <laughs> but uh, Jacob, your first, your take first on Mike Williams having this terrific metric and being on this list with a lot of wide receivers that are just elite. Um, he's always been really good against man coverage. I really wanted to get um, Matt's perspective on this and see how he graded out in reception perception. I haven't seen that on the site quite yet um, for last year. But yeah, I think there's definitely like a lot more upside with Mike Williams than people realize. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah, his his 2022 sample is not up on the site yet. Uh, historically, he's been – I think he gets profiled as one of these guys that gets like zero separation. Um, by the way, almost – as a disclaimer, almost any time you hear somebody say like, oh, he's only a contested catcher, he's only a jump ball guy. Um, if they're an above average starting NFL receiver, that's just like not true. You know, Mike, Mike Evans, great example. Mike Williams, great example. I would say that Williams is – in terms of his ability to get open against man coverage, he is like a average to slightly above average, like 50th to 60th percentile type range against man press coverage, which is good enough. 
when you're also one of the top three, you know, contested catch jump ball receivers in the NFL. These guys who are below average separators against man and press coverage, but only win contested catches. Um, I probably bring up because I, I bring up this player way too much because I just call it the Devonte Parker axis of wide receivers, like these guys that never sustain career success, like these guys that are. Um, these guys that are probably a, a below average starting NFL X receivers, but yeah, I like Mike Williams. You mentioned Adam, the frustrations of um, about him in fantasy. A lot of that does come down to roll too. Like these X receivers, if you are not a superstar level player, you know, the Jamar chase range, the, um, the, the Mike Evans range, if you're not that level of player, you're going to be frustratingly inconsistent because those are the most difficult throws and targets. And that's why it's like, there are going to be times when, Justin Herbert's take Justin Herbert takes those throws and then there's going to be times when he doesn't take those throws and he hits Keenan Allen he hits Austin Eckler because those are just easier layup targets uh but yeah I think Mike Williams is a very good player he's going to be one of the really hard, he's gonna be one of the difficult guys to, to rank in fantasy because I, st I still think Keenan Allen's got it um it, there's going to be a lot of targets up for grab but I certainly think that getting out of the Joe Lombardi, um, you know, offense can be good for almost all of these guys in, mm -hmm. in LA yeah Kellen Moore just said Justin Herbert has a cannon we're going to throw the ball deep um, I loved Mike Williams before the Quinton Johnston draft pick, but you know, if, if Williams can be healthy, maybe Johnston just won't really matter that much as a rookie, which is certainly possible uh, so, yeah. in the last uh, let's see over the last five seasons among wide receivers with 200 or more targets. Mike Williams is fifth in yards per target behind AJ Brown, Justin Jefferson, Tyler Lockett, and Mike Evans. He's ahead of Jamar chase, Tyree kill Debo Samuel. And then a guy, Miko Hardman, joins that list. But, um, <laughs> but uh, like terrific metrics for Mike Williams. It's interesting because I, I don't really like him that much. Uh, I mean, I, I liked, okay, I didn't like him last year. He was going in the third round and I was a little nervous about him. Yeah. But I saw his ADP after this year and he was like fifth round, you know, a couple of months ago. ADP so unreliable. It's like that guy's going to be a great value. Um, but then they drafted. Uh, Quentin Johnson in the first round. So I haven't quite landed on where I am with Mike Williams. Anyway, that's my Mike Williams rant. Jacob, what's next? Yeah, I, um, on the T Higgins topic, I wanted to bring up Brandon Ayuk and Devonte Smith are two guys that you will see if you're watching on YouTube. Um, also in the top 10 in yards per route run versus man coverage last year, two young ascending receivers. And I wanted to ask you guys for dynasty purposes, are you taking, or how would you rank Brandon Ayuk, T. Higgins, Devontae Smith, and Christian Watson. I think for most, oh. I, Ayuk is like the clear fourth out of that list, but I know that Adam is very high on Ayuk, and I really am as well. Uh, um, I, would, I wouldn't. I would Okay, wait. <laughs> All right, give me the list again. Brandon Ayuk, T. Higgins, Devontae Smith, and Christian Watson. From Dynasty? For Dynasty. Yeah, he'd be last. Um, I think I'd clearly ha have him ahead of Watson, and I think I have him ahead of Higgins as well. I think the upside for him to be like a true wide receiver one in an offense um, is higher and closer than it is for T. Higgins at this point. I feel like he's going to need to get traded for that to happen. That's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, Ayuk has been a better receiver. I just looked before the show for the last year and a half than Debo Samuel. Um, just more prolific receiver, I should say. Um, I, I would rank them Devontae Smith, T. Higgins, but extremely close. And I would take Higgins over Smith in redraft, but Smith over Higgins in, in Dynasty. Smith, Higgins, uh, Watson, Ayuk. But I could see I could see putting Ayuk ahead of Watson, I guess, because there's a lot of uncertainty with Watson. How about you, Matt? Yeah, so again, to reference the 25 and under article I did is pure players. I had the list. Uh, Devontae Smith was fourth overall. Uh, Ayuk was fifth overall and Higgins was seventh overall and Watson was like in the honorable mentions group. So as players, I think Watson is a distant fourth and I would put him fourth in the, in the dynasty rankings because, because of that. Right. So for me, I have it. I have it Higgins right now as the top guy. I reserve the right to change my mind. I have Higgins right now as a top guy because he's just in such a good situation. And I think they're going to keep that band together. Like I think the Bengals are going to move heaven and earth to make sure they have chase burrow and, and, and Higgins all locked up for the long term. Uh, I think Devonte Smith is my second ranked guy there because I think he is just a really good player. I think the situation is good. I, like, I think he is again, it, like uh, he's a one B receiver, just like, uh, just like T Higgins is to, to an elite number one receiver in AJ Brown. 
man, I mean, you said it, Adam, and I'll say it with like the, the a, a bigger stamp here. Brandon Ayuk is the better receiver than Debo Samuel, mm-hmm. and he does it in a a more difficult role. Like I mentioned that at that list we saw earlier in the show. Ayuk is a pure, true X receiver. Like he's not getting these gimmicky touches, and there's no, there's nothing wrong with being that type of player. He's getting his yards from like running real big boy NFL routes against press man coverage. Hmm. It last year, Ayuk 91st percentile success rate versus man, 89th percentile success rate versus press coverage as that 49ers X receiver. It probably does have to come with a trade or like the 49ers completely remake their receiver room. Like they move on from Samuel's contract who admitted that he had a down season last year. Kyle Shanahan talked like he talked with Shanahan about that. Like Kittle gets moved on from uh, McCaffrey gets moved on from and like they cement Ayuk as the number one there, which is possible, but it, it feels very similar to like Stefan Diggs in Minnesota where like we all like universally, he was accepted as a, a really good player, but he was posting those like success rates that I just mentioned, actually even better. Those success rates I just mentioned uh, for Ayuk, he was at that le- Diggs was at that level in Minnesota. And then he just, he, it required the trade required the quarterback uh, to be elevated to an elite level like Diggs was performing at an elite level in reception perception in Minnesota and now he's producing statistically at an elite level because he's just in the right situation so I think Ayuk is still third in my dynasty rankings just because I don't want to project that but I will always hold out hope that he could be like a 14 1500 yard receiver in the right situation he is really truly that good yeah I'm sorry if I could follow up here because you so you're saying Christian Watson right now is is by far you know the last on this list uh, totally get that based on what you watched and how you graded him out. So I would say that Watson it came into the NFL as a very raw product and has mm-hmm. a lot of room for improvement. So how did you factor that in? And maybe like, wh- how did, how was Brandon Ayuk graded out after his rookie season? You know, like, did he get a lot better? Um, how do players get a lot better as you continue to watch them year over year? And could that be something that we see from Christian Watson? So it it is definitely possible for sure. There have been guys, um, you know, th- that have been that big perimeter receiver that come in raw in the NFL and then they get better. Um, the best example is is Devonte Adams, who like had, but that's such an outlier. You know, he he had like a first percentile success rate versus man coverage as a rookie, and then he's reached like the 99th percentile. So he's literally gone from the the bottom to the top. That does not happen very often. For the most part, like Eric Eager of Sumer Sports used to be at PFF, actually did a study on reception perception data. How great I can re- reference somebody else's work on my work, uh, <laughs> which is great. That's I love. I actually re- legitimately do love when people do stuff like this. Uh, so he ha- put an article out where found that like rp metrics especially man coverage is some of the most stable stuff you can find in terms of nfl stats so it it is possible definitely that watson takes a leap Ayuk, i think doesn't fit into that category because he came in and had an excellent success rate versus man coverage rookie season second season third season uh but he was another guy that was regarded as a raw route runner coming into the nfl so it is definitely possible that christian watson takes a leap and you know that's part of the reason i do like the in-season rookie report um for, for some of these guys is like to track that. But yeah, I think he's a, he's a really interesting guy for sure uh, that, that could take that leap. But right now, just like right now, I think he is really not close to those other three guys as players. We just talked about. Okay. All right, Jacob, I'm sorry to do this to you. We got, I'm giving you the five minute warning here. So uh, you can guide us for the rest of the way. We, I don't think we've talked about press coverage really. Where, where do you want to go from here? No worries. Yeah. We'll, we'll wrap up quickly. I really wanted to mention CD lamb. So CD lamb, Year three was a prove it year for CeeDee Lamb, and he really, really proved it. His uh, yard per run rate rose from 59th percentile in year two to 91st percentile in year three when facing man coverage. Um, when facing press coverage, it rose from 30th percentile in year two to 93rd percentile in year three. Um, so definitely go check out CeeDee Lamb's profile on receptionperception.com. Matt wrote about him in more detail. Um, super, super exciting stuff we saw from him, and I think – he was doubled at a really high rate, which is surprising for a slot receiver. And I think with Brandon Cooks there, it's just going to open things up for him even more. Um, another guy I wanted to bring up was Amonra St. Brown. Amonra St. Brown, as a rookie, dominated zone coverage, as Matt brought up. And versus man coverage, he was still targeted at a high rate, 83rd percentile target per route run rate. Versus man coverage as a rookie. In year two, th- that rose all the way to 98th percentile. And his yard per route run rate efficiency versus man coverage rose from 54th percentile to 90th percentile as well. Um, and so Amon Ra, he's somebody I have a tough time clicking his name over Garrett Wilson or for Dynasty over guys like Jalen Waddle, Drake London, Chris Alave, Devontae Smith, these guys that we get so excited for. It feels like the top range 
of these guys' outcomes is much higher than Amonra St. Brown, but I'm not so sure that's even valid anymore. Amonra is winning all over the field. Um, it's not just a slot. So only Tyree Kill and A.J. Brown average more yards per route run on routes coming outside of the slot than Amonra St. Brown did in 2022, even on the perimeter, even versus man coverage. He's just dominating everywhere. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring him up quickly as well. And then Matt, I am very, very excited to end on this note because it's just so obscure and so perfect to just highlight the work that you and I do. Uh, Puka Nakua. If you're unfamiliar with Puka Nakua, Puka Nakua is a fifth round pick for the Los Angeles Rams. He had the highest career target and yard per route run rate of any receiver coming into this draft, including JSN. Um, and <laughs> That's not something you're going to notice at first because he really couldn't put together a full season. He played in run heavy offenses. So the, he, to me is he perfectly epitomizes why per route data is so important. Um, and I just wanted to bring up this uh, quote that I just saw on Twitter from Cooper cup on Nakua. I know this is McVeigh on Nakua. He's a guy that we're expecting to come in, expecting him to be able to contribute and compete. Every spot is going to be earned on this team, but I really like what he's done. And I think it's a credit to everybody around him and his conscientiousness um, Cup has talked about how he's NFL ready as well. And then Matt, you really liked what you saw from him. Again, albeit in a small sample size, you really liked what you saw from him in reception perception, right? Yeah, small sample size. So I do an article uh, each of the last two years on like, I call it the rookie roundup for the prospects where I was not because NFL film easy. You can get that you know through game pass all that for, with the college film it's harder and like you have to have all 22 to be able to chart these routes right that's just that's the way it goes so i only got three games in for for a guy like puka and these other players that are in the uh mini samples rookie roundup it's not a full rp sample but um i did really he was probably my favorite guy in the, in that group right uh i i like him a ton 74.2 percent success rate versus man 73.2 uh, 73.3 percent success rate versus press also pretty good against zone coverage very good on like slants, flats, curls. I think he could be – obviously, he's not going to be a slot receiver because Cooper Cup is their slot receiver. But I think he could be like a flanker type for them. Um, probably not going to be an X receiver. But that's the open spot of the offense because I think Van Jefferson is actually a pretty good player. Um, I think Van Jefferson's shown an ability to be a vertical X in that offense. Um, they need a flanker at this point in 11 personnel sets. And I think Puka could be a really um, interesting guy. He's another one that had like a ton of rush attempts too. Uh, like they really almost use him in like a gadgety way. And he's got great contact balance uh, in the open field. So he's an interesting guy to highlight here. I, I really like him and I'm, I'm not kind of not surprised that they've, you know, hyped him up a little bit. I think this is a really good landing spot for him. As far as the Monroe St. Brown goes, I think what why you have trouble clicking his name over Garrett Wilson. I brought this up uh, on a bus proof episode. I don't know, last week or the week before uh, among 80, the 80 plus wide receivers, some like 80 to 85 wide receivers with 50 or more targets. Amon St. Brown was 73rd in explosive catch rate last year. Yeah. He was a little better as a rookie. He was 57th out of 91 wide receivers with 50 or more uh, targets uh, in 2021. Sorry. And uh, that's, uh, I think, a catch of 16 or 17 or more yards. So the rate at which he's doing that. I don't know that he's not capable of it, but the way they use him, it's like Keenan Allen minus two or three yards of ADOT. It's, he's just so short area, not really doing much after the catch, not making big plays. So maybe he can turn into a different wide receiver, but he, he is going to rely heavily on, on targets, and he's not going to make a ton of plays. He also he caught – he had three catches that were down at the one-yard line. So – uh, maybe it was two catches and a carry, but at least uh, two to three plays where he was down at the one yard line. So that touchdown number could have been higher. But Garrett Wilson is a more exciting player for sure. Uh, from a fantasy perspective, he's not as safe in not in half PPR. I'm going Wilson in full PPR. I'm pretty close to going Garrett Wilson. Uh, but I see I, I see the dilemma there, Jacob, because St. Brown is, you know, to me, it's like Keenan Allen, who never really rarely deserved to be picked in the top like 20. He was more like a 24, 25, two, three turn kind of guy. Um, but you're not going to get St. Brown there. And that's, uh, that's it. J Jacob, this was like, this was the cookies and cream episode. This was, this was terrific, man. It delivered. We were super excited and man, it was delicious. <laughs> and, you know, I was wondering, Matt, like you said, Brandon Ayuk was running big boy routes. Like if you met Debo Samuel, would you ever tell him that he wasn't? <laughs> big boy routes? 
<laughs> hey, I said that Brandon Ayuk is running big boy routes. I didn't say B- Debo Samuel wasn't running big boy routes. Um, I that's what I inferred. I thought you know I thought that's where you're going, but yeah, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You're right, but uh, dude, thanks so much for sharing all this wisdom and uh, you know tell us how we can follow all of your all of your awesome advice. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on for sure. Uh, it was awesome. We, we, we hit on a ton of players. It's great stuff. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, listening and watching. Uh, you can follow me uh, at Matt Harmon underscore BYB on Twitter. Receptionperception.com is the place to find all the stuff that uh, we were throwing around here. And of course, you can follow all my stuff on Yahoo as well. The Yahoo Fantasy Football Forecast is the podcast uh, that I host five times uh, a week during the season. And we're still keeping on going two times a week during the offseason. So check it out there. All right, Jacob, have a great weekend. Matt, same to you. Thank you all for watching and listening. If you're watching live right now on YouTube, please hit the like button, and I'll see you in 45 minutes with my bold predictions. I got two wide receiver bold predictions. I'll tell you guys real quick. It's a little sneak peek. Jerry Judy, top five. Marquise Brown, top – I think I said top ten uh, for Marquise Brown, but uh, those are a couple of my bold predictions I'll be talking about shortly, and a running back is going to finish top five as well. Um, have a good one, everybody. Talk to you soon.